You're good to go. Test. I don't. I don't know if it's picking up. Uh, we're live. As well. Okay. Okay. Good. Yeah. Okay. Welcome everybody. Thanks for coming. Let's get started. You're not going to want to miss a minute of. Uh, this, I promise you. Uh, so thanks for coming. I'm Jennifer Rogers. I run the CAPI Center here at the law school. If you're interested in public integrity issues, please check us out. We're about to post a couple student projects on simplicity, so uh, keep an eye out for those. I want to thank our co-sponsor, SJI, and introduce you to a couple of people. Uh, over here, let's see, stand please. Erica Smock is the new Dean for Social Justice Initiatives and Public Service Lawyering. If you haven't gotten a chance to meet Erica yet. She's fabulous. I've known her for years, so I can say that. I'm very excited about what SJI is going to be bringing us in the years to come. And I also want to do, introduce Rachel Polly next to her. If you have any interest in working in government at any point in your career, whether right after law school or long after, you need to get to know Rachel. She is amazing. She can help you. She knows all about government jobs at all three levels of government, so please seek her out. Um, and just one quick plug, if you're interested in public integrity and government work, you might be interested in the externship that Rachel and I teach next semester, so keep an eye out for that. Is externship fair is on Monday? Monday night. Um, I want to thank Cappy's corporate sponsor, Cobre and Kim, uh, and also say hello to our live stream audience out there in uh, cyberspace. Uh, because we have a live stream audience, if you ask a question, please make sure to turn on your microphone so that they can hear you well. Um, and finally, if you're with us for, or in part, for our C CLE ethics credit that we are offering for today, uh, welcome, and you're welcome, because this is going to be a really exciting ethics credit, I promise you, compared to how they normally are. Um, but please make sure that you've signed in and that you sign out at the end so that we can get you uh, that credit. Um, okay, so I'm thrilled to introduce our guest today, Walt Schaub, who is here to my left, your right. Walt is with the Campaign Legal Center. He's the senior director there for ethics. Before that, Walt was for four and a half years the director of the U.S. Office of Government Ethics uh, from January 2013 until this past summer when he resigned, and he'll tell you about that. Uh, but he's a longtime government ethics lawyer, and I think he's going to talk to us a little bit about the importance of government ethics and kind of where we are today and uh, the challenges that this administration is um, well, I was going to say facing, but maybe creating is, is the better word there. Uh, and in conversation with Walt today is Richard Brafalt to my right. Professor Brafalt, as many of you know, teaches here at the law school in many topics, but is an expert uh, relevant to our purposes in campaign finance, state and local governments, legislation, and just the whole government ethics kit and caboodle. So there's, there's no one better to talk to Walt about these issues. So uh, here we go. Thanks. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, and, and, and I will embarrass Jennifer for one thing, but in case uh, people haven't paid attention to the recent news, Jennifer has assumed an important role in vetting some of the campaign finance practices of our distinguished district attorney. So uh, Jennifer and Cappy, so just a sense of the vital role it, of Cappy plays in New York. And also, uh, in a lot of New York political things, whenever they're uh, the, the the mayor or somebody looks at the crowd and calls out all the assembly members and senators. If you look around you there, I will not call on them right now, but I, I'm sort of stunned to see looking ahead some of the, I'll call them the glitterati of the, of the New York Ethics uh, Conflicts of Interest Board, Campaign Finance Board, and Department of Investigation uh, are, are in the room. So people who are here, who, who did not just come for the lunch, uh, I think. But it's, I think it's a mark of a kind of interest uh, that this topic draws. Uh, I just want to read the opening sentences of the uh, remarks Mr. Shao gave at the Brookings Institution um, uh, back in January, and I think they, they uh, I think they helped put you on the front page all over the country. Took what was a relatively little-known office and made it a lot more known. 
I wish circumstances were different and I didn't feel the need to make public remarks today. You don't hear about ethics when things are going well. You've been hearing a lot about ethics lately. And that was back in January. I don't think anything has changed since then in terms of how much we've been hearing. So I think I'm just going to kick it off. You probably have a lot to say. I'm just going to maybe help shape it a little bit. Uh, maybe just give us a tiny bit of background about what the Office of Government Ethics is and what it does, how you got through building a career in ethics, and then we'll jump into the, the ethical issues of the current administration. Sure. Um, so you can hear me, right? Good. Um, so the Office of Government Ethics is a very small agency. Right now it's got about 70 employees, which makes it not even a small agency or a micro agency. I think mean, it's like a nano agency compared to some of the others. And, um, but it has a very big role. And it oversees an ethics program comprised of 4,500 agency ethics officials. But being the head of that organization, is an interesting challenge because you don't have direct supervisory control over those 4,500 agency ethics officials. And so you have to deploy a range of tools from menacing to coaxing to persuading to pleading to begging to shouting to backslapping, whatever it takes. It's, it's the art of persuasion. And um, you all, so the Office of Government Ethics works with them and tries to get them to hold their agencies to a very high standard of ethics. Uh, and, it, and in fact, the federal workforce is probably the most heavily scrutinized, overseen, investigated, reported on workforce in the world. And, um, and so you have real specialization. You've got inspectors general who are part of the uh, sort of anti-corruption and conflicts of interest mechanism, and they, they do the investigations. You've got the Office of Special Counsel, which does political violations or uh, whistleblower retaliation. The Office of Government Ethics focuses on financial conflicts of interest and business relationships, and that's really its scope. So there, the bribery, for instance, is handled by the Department of Justice. And DOJ, OGE really focuses on that slice of conflicts of interest. It's as simple as if you held Exxon stock, you shouldn't be the one deciding whether Exxon's going to be allowed to drill in some federal reserve. Somebody else should make that decision. Um, but it's an important piece of a well-developed anti-corruption structure in a government. And when we worked with a lot of governments from other countries that were in earlier stages of setting something up, maybe conflicts of interest wasn't their immediate concern, and it's something you can get to later. Um, but our focus was on resolving conflicts of interest and increasing transparency through financial disclosure so people would file financial disclosure reports. There are 28,000 public financial disclosure reports filed in the federal government every year and another 400,000 confidential financial disclosure reports. So it's a massive operation and, and OGE with the 4,500 agency ethics officials works closely to review them under very complex financial disclosure rules and then work with them to resolve conflicts of interest. And I think the one other piece worth mentioning is that um, OGE works directly with presidential nominees for positions requiring Senate confirmation. Uh, and OGE typically has a lot of leverage there because uh, the individuals want to get confirmed, but they can't get confirmed until they can have a Senate hearing, and they typically can't have a Senate hearing until OGE has signed off on their financial disclosure report and the ethics agreement that resolves their conflicts of interest. Um, and then the one other thing OGE does regularly is, uh, in connection with the agency ethics officials, it conducts program reviews where it goes out and essentially audits the agency ethics program to make sure it's functioning well and um, conducts training for agency ethics officials. So I was, I was drawn to this area because having grown up in the Washington, D.C. area and having had a father who worked in government, I always wanted to go into public service. And I didn't know what shape that necessarily was going to take, but I definitely wanted to work in public service. And so after law school, I got into the government. And one of the nice things for any of you who are considering public service is you get, at a very young age, a very broad range of experiences, especially if you, you know, ask for those kind of assignments and seek out that breadth of experience. 
uh, it's really there to be had in the government. And as I dabbled in different areas, I was re consistently drawn to the ethics area and actually wound up going to OGE in 2001. And except for a couple years when I left to go work for a law firm, uh, and then they recruited me back when they were having trouble filling a management position, um, I've been there for, for a total of about a decade and a half. Let me ask you one, before we, one more preliminary, which is you've said a lot of things about regulations. People hear the word ethics, and they sometimes think ethics as like being ethical in the sense of knowing from right and wrong, being nice. It, we, we often in law school, we contrast law from ethics or law and morality. They should go together, but we think of them as two separate categories. There's a lot of law here, right? Yes, and um, typically, actually, all we ever talk about is the law. It's... Um, there's, a, there's criminal conflict of interest statutes, there's criminal post-employment restrictions, there's criminal prohibitions on representing individuals before the government, while you're in the government, or accepting compensation, um, either before or after you're in the government, if it covers a period of time when you were in the government. There's also civil penalties associated with having certain types of conflicting jobs outside the government, um, including, for instance, serving on a board of directors of a corporation. Uh, and so there's a lot of rules there. There's also standards of conduct that are regulatory, and the penalty is disciplinary action. You'll, you'll be fired from your job. But the rules actually are very legalistic and very complex. And... Um, to this audience, I would emphasize that down in D.C., the harder challenge I have is emphasizing the non-legal parts because uh, D.C. having such a regulated and overseen workforce, they only think about the legal aspect. In reality, there's also uh, stand principles of ethics that were articulated by George Bush Sr. in an executive order that's still in place and violations of those can lead to disciplinary action and termination, even if you don't violate one of the actual regulations that we usually focus on. And then, as I probably will have a chance to talk about later, there's certain ethical norms that the rules and the laws are predicated on the idea that those are in place and that they'll still be in place. So there are some things the rules don't cover because nobody thought they would need to be covered. Right. I mean, because so as you point out, there there are real panel, there are real consequences and real penalties. Yeah, and and the consequences are actually um, real. Um, depending, you know, different things at different levels. For career employees, it's very strict, and and people have lost their jobs over it, or been demoted, or been suspended without pay for long periods of time. Uh, more at the political levels, there are a number of people who have paid civil penalties or fines. Uh, and then a small number who have actually been prosecuted. Uh, and I say small because it takes, in, in, as a practical matter, it takes more than a technical violation to persuade the Department of Justice to prosecute. So let's get to the current administration. Uh, you, you became famous uh, in the, as the administration was taking shape. And, yeah. so, and on the issue you earlier about uh, the, the then president-elect's plans with respect to his businesses. So why don't you tell us a little bit about how that issue shaped, kind of what's the, back, the legal background for that, uh, the, what do we know about the factual background, how that took shape, and, and actually what's happened with all that? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, first of all, the Office of Government Ethics has a role in trying to foster public confidence. It was, an, it was a post-Watergate creation uh, when they enacted a sweeping set of civil service reforms in 1978, and that brought about changes to how the civil service was structured. It created the Inspector General, because the Inspector General Act was passed at that time, as was the Ethics and Government Act, and a number of other similar provisions that were intended to really improve public confidence um, following Watergate. And it's been amended a number of times, always in response to the latest crisis. Um, and, but one of the functions OGE was always supposed to have was communicating with the public. And I declared in my um, confirmation hearing and in some of the materials I had to submit as part of the confirmation process that my goal was to increase public engagement, both as a means of um, improving transparency and as a means of instilling some confidence on the part of the public to the extent possible. In a hyper-polarized society, you're only going to reach so many people without a massive advertising campaign. And, um, 
and then hopefully to engage the public in some of the oversight work. You know, with respect to the 28,000 public financial disclosure reports, they're out there for people to look at and to identify things that, that pose conflicts and, and compare them to what they know officials are doing. Um, but we had basically been standing on a street corner waving our arms, jumping up and down and screaming, hey, look over here for four years, and no one noticed us. Um, we were proud when we managed to go from zero to 500 uh, followers on Twitter after three and a half years of trying. Uh, six months later, we had 57,000, so something changed. Um, and, and what changed was at the election, but if I can talk a little bit about the before the election, um, the, the environment in D.C. is so legalistic and there are so many requirements that the transition is actually an enormous undertaking to set up a government. And this year they had 73 days to do it. So starting two years out, we started training people, increasing training in government ethics rules and, and some of the legal requirements. And starting in about April, we were working with a nonprofit group um, called the Partnership for Public Service and a number of other government agencies that provide service during the transition to prepare the transition teams of each campaign. And what I think the public might be surprised to hear is that both campaigns participated in this activity, both of the major party um, campaigns. And they were in the same room at the same time, and despite all the vitriol on the campaign trail, they got along very nicely. They played nicely in the sandbox. And um, a lot of the people on the Trump transition team were from uh, Chris Christie's um, camp, and some were from uh, former Governor Romney's camp, uh, because Romney had built what would have been the biggest, mo most impressive transition effort in history, he had seen how well the transition went for President Obama and he invested extensive resources in building capacity to surpass that, uh, and then he didn't win. So we worked with these folks for five months and trained them. The, the day of the election, I sent good luck emails to both sides, and the day after the election, I sent a congratulations email to the winning side and got some nice emails back from them saying, you know, OGE's really worked with us, you've been great, we're looking forward to working with you. And I have to say, the individuals in President Trump's um, transition team were really earnest and really focused and had really put in the work to learn what they were doing. Uh, and they said, we'll call you this afternoon. And then they disappeared. Um, and I never saw them again. Um, and um, apparently they'd been pushed out um, and replaced by the individual who's now the, the um, counsel of the president, Don McGahn, who made his fame um, by kicking the legs out from under the Federal Election Commission when he was uh, the head of the Federal Election Commission. And uh, so has spent much of his life, in my view, uh, undermining anti-corruption mechanisms in our country. And so he was well poised to do it again. Um, and it took weeks to get him, several weeks to get him to finally meet me. And, and finally, after repeated efforts to get him to agree to meet with OGE, just to impress upon him uh, what uh, he needed to do, because with 70 days, having already lost about three weeks, we were pretty terrified that this thing was going off the rails. And um, finally, the only way I could get him to come was sending him an email that I knew he wouldn't want released in the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, and it got, within five minutes, a response saying, let's meet Monday. Um, and um, we met Monday, and I never seen anybody more unprepared for an undertaking and more clueless as to all of the legal requirements. Um, so I walked him through some of the most basic elements. What do you have to do in a transition? Well, first of all, you have to hire some people. And they have to comply with ethics rules. So I talked about the various ethics laws. And you have to do a background investigation. I talked about coordinating with the FBI. I talked about reviewing the background investigation report. Um, to see if they can get a clearance before you move forward. And he asked if I was the one who made that decision, and I explained to him he was, um, to his great surprise. Um, and um, so, it, you know, it went downhill from there pretty fast. Um, at that low point, I, I thought we were as low as we could go, and we'd, we'd make up some time, but we didn't. Um, 
One of the difficulties was the president kept announcing nominees um, before doing the ethics work. And I repeatedly tried to explain to the transition team that if you announce people before they have the ethics work done and before the background investigation and before the Senate questionnaire, you could wind up embarrassing them or maybe even destroying their careers if it comes out that you nominated them and then they had to walk away. Well, not come out, you've put it out there. And um, so typically that work is done behind the scenes and it's typical for people to walk away because the requirements are so extensive. Um, but that wasn't the case and they were very slow in getting us the nominees. Um, because of the bad tone set from the top with the president not willing to resolve his conflicts of interest, some of the nominees pushed back harder than others, and that was a consistent theme this year. Not all, mind you. Some, some were very focused and very cooperative, but uh, those who were not were more difficult than we'd seen before, uh, and they had more complex financial interests than their predecessors. And um, so we were in a state of catch-up, and then, uh, and the one other thing I'll mention before I hand the baton back is um, as we headed into the period when the inauguration was getting closer, uh, the Senate, out of frustration, started scheduling hearings even before finalizing the ethics work. Uh, and this was a real threat to OGE because the, the leverage we had, as I mentioned earlier, is you can't get a Senate hearing until you complete the ethics work. And that's an important leverage in getting people to resolve their conflicts of interest. If you lose that, you lose your leverage. Um, and so one of the fights that made the newspapers in DC, but I don't know if it was heard around the country, was writing to the Senate some, some relative to the ethics world, hot email letters um, demanding that they reschedule uh, the hearings. And, I didn't know that they were gonna do that, but fortunately they did. I think the more experienced people in charge of the committees there in the Senate recognized w what a disaster it could be if they confirmed somebody and then ethics problems arose. So they, so they wound up backing down and rescheduling the hearings. Um, but that's, that's sort of how we got off to a bad start right from the beginning. So um, where do things stand now with respect to the president's business interests, his involvement or not in them, and how well or not does this satisfy ethics constraints and what problems do you see if they don't? Good, well that gets to the thing I alluded to earlier when I said there's a very complex body of law and regulation in place, but those laws, that legal framework was predicated on the idea that there were certain ethical norms in place that would continue to be adhered to. And as long as you have those in place, you don't need other rules. Um, and so, for instance, the president is not subject to the primary criminal conflict of interest statute. But as I mentioned in that speech that you read the first line from, it's not that he's exempt from it as a perk for attaining high office or a reward of some sort. It's because the criminal conflict of interest statute is a recusal statute, not a prohibited holding statute. It says you cannot participate in a particular matter in which that will have a direct and predictable effect on your financial interest. Well, you can't have the president of the United States recusing from things. You need the president to care, fulfill his responsibilities. Um, and as a result, they didn't cover him by this law. Uh, some have made some constitutional arguments. I, I think those are kind of derivative of the idea that he wouldn't be able to do, fulfill his constitutional responsibilities but I just think it's more immediate than that. We, we, we can't do without our leader. Um, a, an alternative would be to have a prohibited holding statute for the president, perhaps with more exceptions because uh, it, it imposes a, a heavier burden than a recusal statute would. But... Um, you but can I interrupt one second just to yeah. make sure everyone understands the difference between prohibited holdings and recusal. So let's say the Secretary of Defense has uh, stock in a major defense company and an issue comes up with respect to them. He recuses, how does the decision get made? So um, in actuality, and, and this has been a point of some confusion in DC, you don't file a document saying I recuse or I'm disqualified or I'm staying out of it. You simply recuse by not participating. Um, and, but in, in so the deputy secretary is, is asked to make the final decision or something right, like that. Right, right, and, and to the extent that it's predictable in advance, 
uh, you, you avoid the conflict from coming up by divesting. So it has the effect in many cases of serving like a prohibited holding statute because you could technically, as Secretary of the Department of Energy, hold Exxon and Chevron and Dominion Power and all kinds of things um, and not have to divest them and not break any law. But you would have to sit with your feet up on your desk and read the newspaper all day because you couldn't do the essential functions of your position. And maybe one more technical thing for everybody out there. What's a blind trust? Because that comes up a lot in these conversations. He, then he doesn't divest, he puts it in blind trust. What's a blind trust? And then I guess in this context, there was the semi-blind and the fully seeing trust. So why don't you tell a little yeah. bit about the, what a blind trust is, how that comes Good. up in these discussions. So to do that, I just have to finish on the conflict of interest statute. Um, so it exempts the president. And, and our president made the comment in an interview, I think, with the New York Times that a president can't have a conflict of interest. Well, that's just baloney. Um, common sense dictates you can have a conflict of interest. It's any time you have two interests and they conflict. Um, and, um, but the difference is the law does not assign criminal penalties for having a conflict of interest. So really what he's saying is I can do stuff that everybody who works for me would go to jail for doing. Well, that's, that's a pretty low standard to aspire to. Um, and... Um, uh, most presidents in the past have resolved these by either divesting and rolling into assets that their subordinates would be allowed to have or by entering into a blind trust. Um, now, what I would actually recommend in this case would be that he sold and didn't start a blind trust but actually rolled them into diversified mutual funds because there's an exemption for diversified mutual funds that are actually registered with the SEC. That's the threshold question. If they're registered with the F SEC and they don't focus on a particular sector of the economy or a particular country other than the United States, they're exempt. And so he could have consistent with that just simply purchased mutual funds and, and made sure that they were not sector focused. Um, but the other alternative that some have done is a blind trust. Now, in 1978, when they passed the Ethics and Government Act, they wanted to harmonize the approach to blind trust. Various people have had blind trusts before. Lyndon Johnson set up a blind trust. But it's whatever they said it was. And they just said, well, they won't tell me what's in it, with varying levels of discipline. Um, but they wanted one disciplined, consistent approach in both the legislative and executive branch, and they wanted it to adhere to certain requirements. And um, so they passed this law and said no other kind of blind trust would qualify. Well, there's actually two, and, and there's probably only one of the two types worth talking about. But first, I'll talk about the kind that's not worth talking about in any length. And that's because President George W. Bush had this. It's a diversified trust, a qualified diversified trust, which is a type of blind trust. You have to put in assets. And they have to be diversified to the extent that no more than 5% of the portfolio of the trust is in any one asset, and no more than 20% is in any sector. That's kind of hard to do, and our current president's holdings wouldn't qualify for that. Um, but if you had a broad-ranging portfolio of stocks, you could put them in there. And then they're immediately exempt from the conflict of interest statute. And as they're sold off, um, you're not told what is bought in its place. And the theory being that it's sufficiently diversified that you're not going to be able to take an action to benefit one asset without potentially harming another so you don't have a serious conflict. That's almost never done because the statute also requires that you let the trustee file your personal income taxes, not just your trust taxes. And, and that gets into a whole lot of family planning issues that, that people don't like. Um, so the main kind of blind trust that you see is called a qualified blind trust. And it has to meet very strict requirements, and it has to be set up through OGE. And right now, there are exactly zero in the executive branch. There's some in the legislative branch. And the reason is because it doesn't solve a lot of problems. You have to sell down to cash, basically, because whatever you put in the blind trust is, not a, conf is a conflict of interest until sold. Um, so it doesn't avoid the problem of having to divest to avoid conflicts of interest. And you have to disclose whatever you put in it. And anything you held that you didn't put in it, you have to disclose. So it doesn't solve the burdens of disclosure. The only thing it really achieves is it enables you 
to get a higher rate of return because they can invest in things that might otherwise be conflicting. Um, the reality, though, is the trustees are terrified of being sued, so they're just going to buy diversified mutual funds, which you could have anyways, and now you're paying double the management fees. So, there, so, so I wasn't actually advocating that he do a blind trust. I wanted him to move into diversified mutual funds. Um, but there's no such thing as a semi-blind trust or a half-blind trust or a half-baked trust. I mean, it's just utter nonsense, and it's a sham. And my suspicion, even though Sherry Dillon, the attorney, stood up on TV and at one point in that long press conference with what appeared to have been fake documents <laughs> sitting on the table, and I say that based on photographs of the manila folders that have no words on them, so what's the point in grouping things into folders if you don't label what the grouping is? And none of them were dog-eared or tagged, and if any of you have done a summer internship in a place that still uses paper, the paper's a mess. Um, and, um, uh, but she did at one point say it's not a blind trust. Uh, but I suspect that the purpose in setting up a trust was to have the American public think, oh, it's a blind trust, or sort of a blind trust. And, and so there's an element of what seems to be deception there to me that really rubs me the wrong way. But it serves zero purpose, because the conflict of interest is not based on you spending your time doing day-to-day -day running of the organization because you couldn't do that anyways. You'd have a full-time job being the president of the United States. And so um, conflicts of interest are based on your financial interests. The, the goal is to eliminate a financial incentive to make a decision and to make sure that your decisions are based on your policy aims. And the law is neutral as to what your policy aims is. They could be extremely far left or extremely far right. That's it's content neutral, but you should be basing it on your policy aims and not on your personal financial interests. Um, and so this thing that they set up, you know, there was this media report where everybody got very excited when he amended the blind, <laughs> the, the trust, not the blind trust, the fake blind trust, um, to allow him to take money out of it. I kept getting calls from reporters wanting us to talk about that, and I've gotten them even after I left government. And my answer is, it was worthless when it started. So how do you divide zero by anything and have anything <laughs> worse than what you started with? So yes, one or two more questions, and we might go to the audience. Oh. So what's, some people are exercised that he spends a lot of time at Mar-a-Lago. Yeah. Why is that an ethics problem? Well, I'm one of them. Okay. And um, <laughs> the answer is this. The, this is using the presidency to advertise your properties. They doubled the membership fee at Mar-a-Lago. Uh, there was a brochure at um, the New Jersey golf course that touted that if you rent it for an event like a wedding, he might pop in as president <laughs> and say hi, so added value to your, to your wedding if you, if you like that. Um, I think you have to pay extra for him to not stop by. <laughs> but, um, and, um, um, and in fact, we've seen on video him stopping by and, and saying hi to the guests. And, um, you know, we saw, uh, and so every one of these trips is um, an advertisement for his properties. But I don't think people fully appreciate the extravagant cost of each of these trips. We are talking millions and millions of dollars at this point. Um, the Secret Service alone is reported to have paid him into his pocket $137,000 to rent golf carts to chase after him to protect him. So they're paying, for the privilege, paying him for the privilege of protecting him. And um, there was a recent report by CNN of something like $60,000 and they redacted the daylights out of the documents but their experts at CNN told them that these were probably room charges paid to the Trump um, property. And of course, when he was up here um, on Fifth Avenue, I guess is where his property is, um, uh, the Secret Service got into a, a negotiations that broke down at one point over the cost that they were having to pay him, and he wasn't going to cut them a break. Um, so there's the direct profiting off of them coming there. But then there's the, the, the promotional aspect of it. Uh, we saw that too during a hurricane um, conference, I think it was Harvey, where he's wearing a hat that he's selling on his website. You know, I wonder if it says as seen on TV on the website. He didn't check. Um, but 
Um, but the cost to you when they have to fly the Secret Service out there is extraordinary. We've learned recently the cost per hour of taking these government planes. And um, the other thing that's incredible is watching the cabinet officials and the White House officials get on planes too. And so the entire team is going off to eat, what did he call it, beautiful chocolate cake while lobbing bombs at an airfield in Syria um, that they could be doing from DC for free. And that's just extraordinary. And, and so it's no wonder that we had cabinet officials flying around in charter planes when this is the tone you're setting from the top. And probably the most cynical, depressing thing I've seen yet is the um, issuance by um, the individual who sort of staged a coup at the Office of Government Ethics after I left that parroted some of the White House's talking points and kind of vaguely wagged its fi his finger at uh, cabinet officials saying, you know, you have to do better and just because it's legal doesn't mean you should do it and you should basically saying don't fly around on these planes. My comment to a reporter when they call me for a comment is, well, call me back when the president stops flying these planes to his properties and advertising them on our dime. Um, because it, it's just inconsistent, this idea that you will hold cabinet officials and sub-cabinet officials to a higher standard than their boss. And um, it's sort of the same as DOJ on the first day of this administration reversing it's 30 or 40 year, I think it was 40 year old position on, nepo, on the nepotism law saying that it applied to the White House and now suddenly it doesn't. Um, but it applies everywhere else in the government. So Wilbur Ross will lose his job if he hires his kid, but his boss won't lose his job if he hires his kid. Uh, and so that sort of turns the concept of ethics on its head that the higher up you go, the stricter you should, the stricter the set of rules you should follow. Two last questions, then we'll go to the audience. So tell us what you're doing now at the Campaign Legal Center and um, how, how's that working out? <laughs> yeah, so the Campaign Legal Center is a wonderful organization. They made the news a couple weeks ago uh, leading the charge in a Supreme Court case to end extreme partisan gerrymandering. Now notice I said extreme partisan gerrymandering. It's not even just partisan gerrymandering. So if we can't end extreme partisan gerrymandering, something's wrong here. Um, but um, the, the oral arguments went very well and we're optimistic about the outcome. And I think it's probably the one decision that if it changes could do more to change um, the, the potential for corruption in our country than just about anything else. Uh, we have, I think, members of Congress, including members in the majority, who I think would be more willing to take a stand over some of the abuses in the executive branch if they weren't in hyper-gerrymandered, hyper-partisan districts where they can't uh, take a reasonable position on things that they clearly would have opposed if somebody in a different party had done it. Um, and um, we're broadening into the ethics area. Uh, a lot of what we're going to do is basically similar to what I was doing at OGE, but the goal is to make sure it keeps hold, upholding the same standards. There was a lot I couldn't say and couldn't do in government. Ultimately, my boss was the president, and I had to take orders from the White House. Uh, and I finally quit when I reached a crossroads where I didn't think I could make a difference, and, I, and they were adapting to the approach I was taking. And... Um, basically cut us off from information and I was going to have to certify White House financial disclosure reports that they had no conflicts of interest when they wouldn't tell me what these individuals do for a living. And so I had half the equation. Here's the financial interest, but I can't compare to see if they conflict with your duties. Um, and I didn't feel I had grounds to refuse to certify them because I didn't know that there was a conflict, but I couldn't certify them because I didn't know that there wasn't. Uh, and in that untenable position, I decided I had to quit. It was the only honorable thing I could think of doing. Um, but I'm continuing some of that work. I'm working a lot with members of Congress's staffs on legislation, um, conducting educational sessions for members of Congress and for reporters to help make sure that the quality of reporting on these issues is good and to try to prod them to keep the sustained focus on ethics issues. We've got some legislative proposals. We've also filed complaints um, most recently against um, Secretary Zinke 
for what appears to have been charging uh, donors at a campaign fundraising event to take pictures with him as the Secretary of Interior, taking selling office to a whole new level, if it's true. Um, and um, we're also interested in kind of broadening into states, because as a Virginian, uh, I had to, the, the displeasure of unpleasant experience of watching my governor prosecuted and then let off the hook. Um, and I'm very disappointed in the Supreme Court's McDonald decision, but we will, possibly wouldn't have even had to go there if Virginia had better conflict of interest laws and, and gift rules. And so uh, the goal is to try to work with state governments to, to help raise the standards in the states where I think the situation um, has been difficult for a long time. Um, and, the, and also some, some congressional ethics issues. So. Last question, which is, I don't know, this is a, uh, to go back to your original, uh, my original quote from you, we don't talk about ethics when things are going well, you're hearing a lot of ethics lately. Yeah. Um, best of times, worst of times, or is there, what, what, what's, what hope is there and should they still think about going into ethics after, after all that's going on? Right. So um, here's what I'd say about that. Um, until, I, I truly believe that government ethics is a nonpartisan issue. I have great things to say about the two administrations I worked with before this one. I had great experiences in the administration of George Bush and Barack Obama. Um, both of those White Houses, whatever you think about their political views or policies, um, were very supportive of the government ethics program and OGE in particular. And really, I couldn't perceive a difference in the sense that I could call the White House and get support for an issue in either of those administrations. Uh, and of course, that ended abruptly this year. Um, and so I think there is hope. I think it's important that this become an aberration rather than the new rule. And because I don't think ethics belongs to either party, I think either party could be guilty of violating ethics. And my big fear is that somebody on the other side could say, well, that guy got away with it, so now I can and you can't question me. I think candidates from both parties need to hold themselves to an even higher standard for a period of time to make this an aberration. Um, I think at my level, where I was the head of a 4,500-person agency and OGE ethics program, I was sort of the spear point and so encountered some of the most difficult things. But on a day-to-day -day level, the staff is finding a lot of areas where they can still make a difference. Um, and, and in differing degrees at different agencies. I think the EPA ethics issue, um, officials and intelligence community ethics officials, I, I, I worry about them. I want to get them some counseling or some, some <laughs> chamomile tea. But in other agencies, um, they are still experiencing at most levels the normal day-to-day -day experience, partly because the, the political positions are just vacant. Um, and, and certainly not through OGE's fault, because we actually moved this administration's nominees faster than we moved to the last administration's nominees, despite all the challenges, um, but because of a lack of interest in filling the jobs. Um, and I still felt every day like I was going into work for the good guys. You know, you're, you're not going to work where you feel afterwards like you have to take a shower because you just represented some big powerful interest in crushing some smaller um, interest. You're, you're, you're there for the little guy, you're there for the country. And I have to say that um, the workplace in the federal government is extremely nonpartisan, more than any other workplace I've ever been in. People do not talk about politics, they leave it at the door, they focus on the issues. Um, and like I said, at the younger ages and, and beginning positions, you get a broader range of experience. But I have to tell you, I've worked with federal employees my entire life, and I have never met a more patriotic, committed, dedicated to public service bunch of people. And they go home feeling good that they've tried to make a difference in the world. And they're under pressure right now. They're under attack right now. But um, most of them are kind of hunkering down and just doing the day-to-day -day job and focusing on the little successes when you can make a difference in somebody's life or in some improving some program. Uh, and I have great confidence in the staff that I left behind. So I would heartily encourage you to consider public service. It's a great life. 
you're not going to get rich, but you're not going to starve. And um, you know, you won't wear the fanciest suits, but um, but you're going to feel good. And I think at the end of, of your life, you're going to look back and feel like you you did something worthwhile. Questions? In the center. Um, hi, I'm Zach. I'm a one L. Um, you just said that you think that ethics is nonpartisan, but it's pretty clear that the ethics rules that are in place right now are being mobilized for partisan purposes. Um, so how do you navigate that tension between the partisan use of ethics and the ostensibly nonpartisan role that ethics regulations play so moving I, forward? I'm not sure I catch your meaning. How do you feel they're being deployed for partisan purposes? I mean, it seems like people are like hammering away at the Trump administration on ethical violations for political ends. See, I don't believe that at all. Um, the goal has been to hold them to the same standard that past administrations have lived up to. And, um, and that's not happening. So, um, you know, I, I, I just don't agree with the premise there. I know that, you know, when I worked with these guys in the White House Counsel's Office, what was clear to me is that they were viewing the world through a partisan lens, that you either are for us or you're against us. You're either letting us get away with whatever we want to do or you're partisan. And they couldn't seem to conceive of the notion that there might be people who've committed their lives to this program. You know, I did this for a decade and a half, and I've been in very, I've, I've seen it all in this program. And um, to me, what I was watching was the destruction of this program. But if they had actually listened to us and done what we said, they would be stronger for it and would, would be even more successful. Because ethics isn't this overlay add-on. It goes to the heart and the meaning of everything you do. And so if you don't have ethics in your activities, they are flawed from the start. And, um, you know, and so for instance, when they were charging that we were somehow being partisan, they made these spurious claims that we were somehow slowing down their nominees. In reality, we moved their nominees faster despite the fact that they had more complex financial holdings and were less cooperative. And um, that's quite an accomplishment to have achieved. And we did it to help them put people in government faster without sacrificing ethics. And so we viewed our role as serving them and helping them stand up a government. So we certainly were not being partisan and undermining that. We were actually treating them better than we treated the last administration. And, um, and I'd say the one area where the ethics is holding, I mean, unfortunately, we've had this bad behavior with part, you know, cabinet officials flying around on these planes, but, um, which is so countercultural to anything in Washington. And if you look back in history, look at Hazel O'Leary and the Clinton administration. The, you know, the, uh, the, the Republican Congress came down on them like a ton of bricks for her behavior. It's, it's just unacceptable behavior no matter who does it. Um, but except for that rash of bad behavior that we've uncovered, what you haven't been hearing about is scandals with cabinet officials having financial conflicts of interest. Because OGE got in there, rolled up our sleeves, and resolved their conflicts of interest. And they, unlike the White House, did what we told them to do, and they're stronger and better protected for it. So I reject the notion that there was anything partisan going on. Hang right behind you, yeah. Um, so I'm from New Jersey, and so I've been following the Senator Menendez trial. Mm. Um, so I was curious if you could just speak about the trial and what's going on, your perspective on that. It turns my stomach. I mean, there's a perfect example of how ethics doesn't have a party. When I, w the allegations against Senator, uh, I mean, I, against Menendez are s so serious, and the, the, the evidence so far seems so compelling. Obviously, he's innocent until proven guilty, but... I'm having a hard time staying in that frame of mind because it looks terrible. Um, and I'm not entirely confident he's going to get convicted after the McDonald opinion. I mean, you could almost, after the McDonald opinion, post on the website rates for holding meetings with people and say, pay me this amount. Now, in the federal government, there's another statute that would kick in, 18 U.S.C. 209. But, um, 
but they really weakened the, the bribery statute. So I think that's a perfect example of neither party owning ethics because the, the behavior that he seems to have committed uh, is atrocious. Um, in the back, yeah. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about the citizens' responsibility in ethics pending lawsuit on the Monument Farm. So um, Crew has filed one of three different lawsuits. Um, there's also one by um, a number of members of Congress, and, and there's well, another one, and I'm blanking on it, but there are three pending right now. Um, so also the ones by the hotel and restaurant? That's people? what it is, yeah, yeah the yeah. local D.C. Right, the um, business community. Yeah. Um, it's hard to say how that's going to come out because there isn't a lot of precedent for... Um, for what emoluments means, and that's what they're struggling with. Um, interestingly, though, there isn't much court precedent, but in the executive branch, we deal with it all the time. And if you look on OGE's webpage, um, I think it's John Kelly, when he was Secretary Kelly, had a, a nominee report where it said he was owed some money in his ethics agreement, and I'm not disclosing confidential information because it's posted publicly, that he was owed some money from another country for some consulting or speaking activity or something, and he hadn't been paid yet. And that triggers emoluments clause issues, and you have to figure out whether it's an emoluments clause. And in fact, there's an office at the Department of Justice, I mean Department of Defense, that exercises some statutory authority to permit it as long as you come and get approval in advance. So although it's novel for the courts, it's a little more day-to-day um, -day practice in the executive branch. Um, I don't know how to predict how that's going to come out, though, because there isn't a lot of precedent. I, I have to say I would not agree with the idea that holding stock in any company, like a publicly traded company, if you held stock in Exxon, for instance, I'd have a hard time believing that you violated the emoluments clause just because Exxon may have sold to a foreign, company, foreign government. But I think the distinction in this case may be that it's a privately held company, totally controlled by one individual or one family, and that starts looking a little bit more like a flow-through entity or an alter ego for, for activities would be the theory under the emoluments clause. Um, and it seems like a good theory to me as long as you're distinguishing publicly traded companies where you're just an individual shareholder. But I, I don't really have the capacity to predict how the courts will come down because there's so little precedent on that. Uh, I wanted to ask about um, Special Counsel Mueller. He was appointed uh, pursuant to the Department of Justice regulation as opposed to prior independent counsels who were appointed by the three-judge panel. And there was a lot of criticism of that independent counsel statute uh, saying it was unconstitutional or, and uh, it led to the contact investigations that could go on for years, but now there's a lot of criticism saying special, the special counsel doesn't have enough independence uh, because he's still subject to the Justice Department. Do you think Congress should be bringing back an independent counsel statute? And do you think that uh, special counsel lawyer needs extra protections in addition to the DOJ rig? So um, I recently was on a panel that had Ken Starr on it, and um, I know at one point at least he had spoken out against the um, Independent Counsel Act. I, I didn't hear him say one way or the other what he thinks of it now. Um, there's some advantage to the current structure in the sense that, to be fair to the president, some of the safeguards in the Department of Justice that are there to protect people being investigated and defendants and the types of things they'll prosecute should be in place to help protect them. And I think the special counsel as opposed to the independent counsel has that advantage that you have sort of an existing framework and some of the norms and practices of the Department of Justice will be applied to the investigation of the president and, and his, and his um, um, administration and transition team. And so I think, I think in some ways that seems more fair to me. And I, I think as long as Mueller doesn't get fired by the president for political reasons, um, then, you know, I'm ready to accept Mueller's decision one way or the other. If he says there's no crime here, there's no crime here. Um, if he is fired, though, it's such a direct attack on the independence of the Justice Department that it calls into question our system of justice. And I think I, for one, will be in the streets. Um, 
but um, I, 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 I like the added fairness of incorporating some of the practices of the Department of Justice rather than an ad hoc entity that, that conducts and does whatever it wants within the parameters the statute sets. Um, I am, however, from the perspective of somebody who served in government a long time, really dismayed by Rosenstein's memo because um, it seems deceptive for him to have written something that says, I, here are the reasons why I think you need to be fired if he already knew, as the president says, that the decision had been made. And that's really a disappointing thing to see an attorney and a government official do. Um, as somebody who spent a lot of time saying no to the White House, and one thing we didn't have time to get in here into here is, you know, I had to go public with this administration as a last resort because the existing practices were not working. Uh, and there were committee reports from the 1980s where Congress said a really good tool for OGE is to go public with things. And, and they added, and in fact, the mere threat that OGE would go public is enough to deter the need for OGE to go public. And that was true in administrations under presidents of both parties until now. But when that threat didn't work, then you have to make good on the threat and actually go public. Um, but in the past two administrations, I had really intense conversations where we're butting heads. I mean, I remember one in the Obama administration where we were fighting just like cats and dogs over a particular nominee. And we were at a real disadvantage because in our government building, they cut the heat off at 6 p.m. And it was about 15 degrees out. And I had a corner office with a lot of windows. And by 11 o'clock, my fingers were just hurting. Uh, and this woman who worked with me, who was really skinny, so she had even less padding, was just miserable. Uh, and we didn't want to let on that weakness, that, that we had this disadvantage in the negotiations. So we're on the phone with people yelling at each other from the White House and from the nominees' representatives and, and the agency ethics official. And it was, you know, the heat of the conversation was enough to keep us from freezing to death. <laughs> um, and finally, sometime after midnight, the White House decided that we were not the weak link. You know, that it, in, they just wanted the nominee to go through. And so the question is, are you going to lean on OGE? You know, are you going to lean on a bunch of bureaucrats who you can probably bully around? Or are you going to lean on this experienced nominee who comes from a, a very successful background and, and has a reputation of being a real fighter? Um, and it took us until about 1230 to convince the White House that it'd be better to lean on the nominee than us, because we weren't going to give. Um, if they had known how cold our fingers were, they might have tried longer. Um, <laughs> but, um, um, but that was typical of the kind of interactions I had with both the Bush and, and Obama administrations, because reasonable people can differ on the exact approach, and we would fight over that. But in the end, they would compromise, or, or they, would, they would listen to us. And, um, uh, and so it's not that we went easy on the Obama or Bush administration. It's just that in the end, you could, you could negotiate with them. Actually, the conversations with this administration were much more pleasant because they were cordial and friendly because they just didn't care what you said and they weren't going <laughs> to do anything. So there was nothing to get heated over. The, the past two administrations, we had really heated, knockdown, drag out fights. But that's, that's the process working. It's the ugly making of the sausage. So. I think we have time for one last question. Um, it, it seems like a lot of uh, what OGE does based on practice and protocols is what's developed over the years. Yeah. Given that and that it seems to have not really worked, what do you do to improve the jurisdiction yeah. of the OGE? And if it's enforcement, how does that fit in within the constitutional framework? So um, the, it, it did work until now. And so we're in new territory. Um, and um, it is based on practice. And the example I gave of the Department of Energy Secretary, there's no law saying the Department of Energy Secretary has to divest those Exxon or Chevron stocks. And we would, however, say, you can't do that job without it, so we're making you divest. And they would. When I say these nominees pushed back harder, they were questioning things like that. Well, show me where in the law it says I have to divest Exxon. 
And we would have these go-arounds where we finally had to get them to the point where they could see that there was no other alternative. And I remember seeing my staff walk out rubbing their forehead a lot saying, why is everything a fight? Because it was down to the smallest thing. In that case, though, with the nominees, we had enough leverage to deploy that we succeeded. And it just was harder and, and drained resources unnecessarily. Um, in, in the case of the president or the White House, um, I do think there would be constitutional problems. I mean, a, a lot of times I'd have the press or others asking, why doesn't OGE do more? Or Congress asking, does OGE want more authority? And I would have to remind them, look, we work for the president. The pre you know, I had to fill out some kind of application for a loan or something, and it said, write the name of your supervisor. And I had to write Donald J. Trump and tell the clerk at the bank to make sure to tell them I'm not being sarcastic. And um, um, so there's a limit. And I also don't think OGE should be an enforcement body. I differ with a lot of the voices out there right now because the prevention aspect of it is real. And even this administration, to the extent that we were able to get their nominees to do what we said, benefited from OGE's work in the prevention area. And they did come to us for advice on a few things, and we would help them. Um, and, and they wouldn't have had that benefit. Uh, so it's a very difficult problem to solve because you could have a statute that says the president has to, for instance, divest financial interests. Um, you could have a statute, it would have to have more exceptions though because it's such a harsher remedy than just you have to recuse if you can't divest certain things. Because you could imagine a president who's not very wealthy not wanting to give up their pension. Or uh, they might be married to somebody who's got a family trust. And so you have to have, you know, like a 50-year-old family trust. Um, so, so it becomes difficult. The reality is there is a, an oversight mechanism that has the power to do something even now, and it's Congress. I think from now on, I don't care which party it is, I'm going to root for there to be a different party in at least one chamber of commerce, whether it's a Democrat or a Republican in the White House, because all that we were taught in our civics classes in high school about checks and balances, they, they should put an asterisk and say, provided that there isn't you know, a political affiliation between the different branches. You have to have some some balance. Um, I'm going to interrupt because I think some yeah. students have to go to their next class and I think we may lose the room to, to, okay. to the next yeah, class. Yeah. So I, and also to make sure while the people are still here we can thank you for all these sure. incredible insights as well as I say thank you for your service sure. and also for the education. Thanks. So we, we do have some legislative proposals around the edges no, to fine, try to I know they gotta chip go away at the problem. But I think the head-on problem. You're still right. uh,